Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, hoping that you can hear me this morning. Not if you can, great. Uh, welcome to the third webinar in a series of four uh, that has been sponsored by the Division of Extended Education at the University of Manitoba. My name is David Manzik, and I'm the Acting Dean of Extended Education. And I welcome you here this morning. Uh, just before we get too far, I just want to remind people that this session will be recorded. Uh, so for those of you who may have to leave early, or those of you who registered but weren't able to attend, uh, the recording should be um, uh, posted on our website uh, a couple days from now. I'd also like, before we actually get into today's session, to just uh, remind us that uh, today's session is coming from the University of Manitoba campuses, which are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota and Denny peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And today we have with us uh, Jessica Bud Scott, who is coming from Athabasca University, located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Plains Cree, the Woodland Cree, the Be uh, Beaver Cree, the Soto, the Nisitapi or Blackfoot, the Métis and the Nakoda Sioux peoples. So having said that and recognizing how important it is for us these days to acknowledge the lands that we work and live on, I'd like to introduce uh, our speakers this morning. To begin with, I just mentioned Jessica, so I'll start with her. Jessica Bud Scott is uh, coming to us from Athabasca University. She is the director of award-winning Power Ed by Athabasca University, which is Canada's online university. Power Ed is an entrepreneurial unit that provides power for businesses who need custom fit skills to lift up their people and results. The Power Ed team is pushing the boundaries of digital learning through enriched on-demand micro-credentials with experiential elements, including immersive experiences, interactive 3D simulated learning, podcasts, docu-series, AI NLP simulations, and much, much more. Jessica has held progressive roles at Athabasca since joining the organization, including being the Director of Partnerships and Student Recruitment and Manager of Corporate Partnerships. And previously, Jessica worked with the Edmonton Oilers, which she, where she pioneered a strategic position focused on developing the, organized digital, the organization's digital media strategy to drive revenue and partnerships. Prior to moving to Edmonton in 2008, Jessica worked for Viacom MTV Networks in Chicago, where she led cable and digital media distribution partnerships and negotiations with Comcast, Time Warner Cable, Verizon Fios, and was responsible for a 15 state territory and led out an award-winning sales team. Jessica's a dual citizen of Canada and the US. Jessica earned her MBA from Athabasca University and a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration and Spanish from the University of Wisconsin, Platteville. She's currently uh, working on her doctorate in distance and digital education from Athabasca. Instilled in her from childhood the importance of women earning an education, Jessica is passionate about women leaving, having access to and achieving an education to enable independent self-reliance and making important contributions to society. So good morning, Jessica, and welcome. Uh, we'll, our next presenter is Rod Lastra, who's my colleague in the Division of Extended Education at the University of Manitoba. And, uh, he is with us, uh, the Associate Dean Academic uh, and Chair of the Program Review Committee in our division at the University of Manitoba. And he's been in that role since 2017. As Associate Dean, he oversees pretty well everything, academic functions related to continuing education, course program delivery, student appeals and disciplinary policies and procedures. Since 2020, he's also been the Associate Area Director for the University of Manitoba Access Program. Rod's worked with program development teams to ensure new continuing education program proposals adhere to governance requirements as determined by the university, as well as external crediting bodies. He has led team efforts to better understand processes related to prior learning and the creation and implementation of alternative credentials. He was involved in the development of the University of Manitoba's new certificate and diploma framework and has led efforts to, up to update non-degree academic admission and progression policies within extended ed. His research interests include development and implementation of alternative credentialing frameworks, 
university continuing and extension programming, lifelong learning theory, university policy frameworks, as well as quantitative modeling, modeling of student academic progression. Rod holds a BSc, MSc, and PhD, which he earned in 2011. So welcome to both of our presenters. I'd like to just say a few words about how today's session will go. Rod will start uh, with more of a theoretical overview of micro-credentialing in Canada as it currently stands. He will take uh, 30 to 40 minutes, roughly, maybe 45 minutes, giving us the theoretical overview uh, in this uh, much contested and much uh, highly anticipated area of micro-credentialing. And then we'll move on to uh, Jessica, who will provide more of an applied practical perspective of micro-credentialing, particularly given her uh, background with Power Ed at Athabasca University. That should take us to about 12, 12.05 our time. We're in central daylight time here in Winnipeg. And then we'll open it up for a 10, 15 minute Q&A at the end. So I encourage you to add any questions you might have as they arise during the presentations and we'll go to the chat function and try to pull a few of those uh, questions together uh, for the Q&A at the end. So I think we've covered almost all the bases. Uh, at this point, we'll hand things over to Rod, who will start with the theoretical piece, and he'll tee things up for Jessica, who will follow. Thank you, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, David. Uh, just if I can get um, a signal from people that you can see my, my slides. Okay, um, so thanks everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, one of the most contentious issues in, I guess, continuing education as of late, which is micro-credentialing. And my, my intent is really to provide um, an overview, a theoretical overview of what we know, uh, the origins, national trends, programming theory, challenges, uh, testing a number of assumptions. I mean, this is a really important thing that we've been uh, playing with for quite some time is uh, a lot of things that we think we know. Uh, the question is, do we really know them? Um, and I've, I've done some preliminary analysis of the data to maybe perhaps initiate some discussions. Talk about the emergent properties of micro-credentialing um, and uh, programming development 101. Also too, if you notice at the very bottom of the slide, uh, there is a thing that uh, shows a little badge, IND. IND means innovative or disruptive idea associated with micro uh, credentials. I just want you to pay attention throughout the presentation because I have personally identified things which I consider to be truly innovative ideas that have come from the micro credentialing framework or things that are disruptive, maybe not necessarily ideas that are unique to micro credentialing, but things that may have impacts along the line. So let's begin with the origins of the word. Now, the origins of the word are, are, are more or less unknown. Uh, we know that the first peer-reviewed articles were published around 2015. That said, the idea of micro-credentialing is long-standing. It's been uh, utilized in industry. It's been utilized in vocational training. It's been utilized by players like Google and Apple uh, and Amazon for quite some time. And in fact, it's been referenced in the Kale uh, prior learning and assessment processes and procedures, perhaps not as micro-credentialing per se, but the, the ideas and concepts that underline what we will be talking about shortly have certainly been around for quite some time. And in fact, I will add that maybe uh, practitioners in continuing education will say that nine-tenths of what we talk about micro-credentialing, we in continuing education have long been doing for decades. Uh, it's the nuances that I think are, are important to point out here. So let's begin with a bit of an overview. First of all, let's talk about definitions. And this is the one thing people are really focusing in on these days. So instead of coming up with a definition myself, I thought maybe I would highlight what are the, the trends in the definition. And I, I call this the evolving or revolving definition stream. Meaning that if we look at uh, what has been published since around 2018, there seems to be some consistency in, in, in the uh, avenue of looking at the assessment of competencies, the assessment of skills, uh, that assessment being certified, uh, the, that, the, that the learning outcomes need to be short, uh, and that perhaps the time spans need, need also to be short as well. 
if you notice the language is very similar. In fact, I will point out that the SICAN 2021 you know, report, uh, their definition is, is very similar in tone to uh, Beverly Oliver's 2019 micro credentialing a definition that was published in, in Australia. So again, there is this, this, this idea that we are using the same concepts despite the fact that we keep saying that there is kind of a dispersive element in, in the actual functional definition. Now, if we were to break down uh, based on what I just showed you, what micro-credential means, the micro part seems to be focusing in on short duration of programming. Now by short duration, here's where there's a big question mark. What does short mean? Well, that really depends. If you're in Ontario, it could be less than 12 weeks. If you're elsewhere, I guess that's defined by the institution or defined by provincial standards. Uh, the other micro part of it could, could come down in, in the idea that we are, we seem to be in agreement, internationally at least, that micro-credentials should focus on discrete skills and competencies. Not higher level, not more comprehensive, but discrete. Now, here's where it gets a little messy. Credential. When we talk about micro-credentials, what does the credential mean? Well, it means a lot of things. It depends where, where we're at, and we don't seem to have a lot of consensus in this, in this field. Number one, if you notice the C's and N's mean credential or no credential, perhaps. So institutionally recognized credentials is one avenue. So micro-certificates or certificates could be one stream depending on your local taxonomy within your institution. In a non-credential stream, the documentation of achievements, either, either through transcripts or through digital wallets. And I put a little plus sign uh, you know, after that, indicating that there perhaps also needs to be a, an articulation in the documentation by way of learning outcomes. I'll talk more about that later. And then the, the, the big one, which is the, the digital badge. In the US, this is something that in places like Purdue has have really taken hold for a number of years and have been used interchangeably with the term credential and or recognition. Nothing fundamentally wrong with a badge. The problem that we have to kind of bear in mind is that within our institutions, are badges authenticated as a credential? And if not, do micro-credentials need to have a credential? So as you can tell, this is where I think there's a, a little bit of a dispersal in ideas. Now let's look at some national trends. And by the way, I'm gonna show you a slide that is not, is breaking all the rules of the PowerPoint 101. So my apologies, I'm not gonna to speak to them, but it's just to show you the volume of activity that has been happening uh, in 2020, 2021. There's been a lot of things that have been coming forward. A lot of reports, uh, uh, a lot of initiatives that are really uh, have uh, fostered further discussion and, and perhaps clarity and some confusion in the realm of what we know about micro-credentialing. There's been a lot of uh, money, uh, short-term and long-term uh, investments uh, through government in the development of micro-credentials. In fact, if we were to sum up the net amount, uh, it's well over $50 million that have been invested uh, in short-term uh, programming initiatives in the country, and well over that for um, uh, slightly longer initiatives. Uh, BC has you know, certainly well articulated their position in terms of what's happening. Alberta is coming along as well. Saskatchewan is developing a, a micro-credentials framework, and they are certainly working in, in, the, in the area of developing and defining their programming stream. In Manitoba, we are um, a little bit behind the rest, I suppose. There are some initiatives that have been going on within our college sector. Within Red River College, for example, there have been a number of um, health-related initiatives, as well as uh, things uh, in, in, in the private sector with, uh, with players like Skip, you know, Skip the Dishes. Ontario is a monster in terms of where things are at with micro-credentialing. The Encampus Ontario initiative that started a couple of years ago, the funding proposals that have come forward, the, the investments of money, the supports to students have certainly led the way in, in fostering dialogue both provincially and nationally in terms of where we're at. So again, I mean, we are, uh, compared to where we were in 2019, 2020 and 2021 have certainly been uh, uh, a year of, of, uh, of knowledge acquisition when it comes to this uh, topic. 
Now let's talk a little bit about pro programming theory. Um, first of all, and I'm going to talk in very general terms here, micro-credentials are, uh, are really focused on identifying in-demand skills based on Industry 4.0, in, in other words, the fourth industrial revolution of automation. Uh, so the programs that are in those in-demand skill uh, fields are expected to be aligned with industry. And as such, there is uh, a, an expectation of consultation, uh, both with academic units that can provide insight as well as industry, very importantly. Now, the one thing I know people are saying to themselves is, wait a minute, we're developing micro-credentials, perhaps not in this area. And that's true. M micro credentials are, are very diverse. But it seems like most of the focus seems to be on these in-demand skills. Uh, but again, I, you know, it's well worth pointing out that there is a, a cornucopia of options out there. Now, how is this done? Well, it's done by actually looking at a, a skills and competency framework. Easier said than done, however. So let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, what the heck is a competency? So in, in higher education, we have to really understand this, this term. Now, um, based on the literature and based on kind of, you know, comprehensive understanding, competency is built on skills, which are built on knowledge, right? So, so when, we, when we think about the word competency, we're really looking at the use or application of, of the integration of knowledge in skills, right? Which means, and this is the important part, which means that when we assess competencies, or we're talking about a competency framework, the assessments have to be different from traditional assessments. That's one. The other one too is that a knowledge, skills, and competency framework really reflects the domain of educational outcomes. So here's what I mean by that. If we were to look at, for example, degrees, degrees are comprehensive, first of all. The education that you get through a degree is a comprehensive endeavor and they cover both knowledge, skills, and to an extent competency. Now, what we do in continuing education is that we focus on the other end of the spectrum. We focus on skills development and we focus on competencies, right? So the combination thereof. And so when we look at micro-credentialing, micro-credentialing in many ways covers the same domains as a certificate, except again, a little bit more targeted, a little bit more micro if you don't mind me using that word. Now, the other aspect that adds a little bit of confusion is that, okay, so if we can agree on competency, the other aspect that we have to look at is competency-based education. What does that mean? Well, that really means that rather than using time-sensitive models, that we're using kind of the inversion of the time seat model. In other words, we're not using the, the, the contact hour or credit hour approach. Where in traditional education, what you do is that you start the clock day one in the class. And then at the end of, let's say, 13 weeks, you stop the clock, you give a test, and you say, okay, where's everyone at? Depending where's everyone's at, you get A, B, C, D, and then you say, move on. And some people will move on with 100% understanding. Some people will move on with maybe 60% understanding of the ideas. In competency-based education, the learner moves on once they've achieved a competency in that specific unit. Now here's a million dollar question, people. Are we doing that in micro-credentialing? Are we really utilizing the theoretical uh, you know, aspects of competency-based you know, competency education, or are we simply substituting traditional forms of, of, of learning? And that, I think, is an important question to, to to bear in mind. Now, the other aspect of, of micro-credentials that are also important is not only do they need to be industry informed to some extent, but they also be, or need to be informed by our learners. And there are things called learner profiles. And I'll talk you know, briefly about this. The learner profiles are really important because they do inform programming design. So for example, if we have an employed person who needs upskilling programming, we've, we will focus uh, the programming based on those specific needs. If we have individuals who have been displaced, perhaps they need a combination of upskilling or reskilling. Mid-career changers may need to actually look at more reskilling programs, and those that are re-entering the workforce, perhaps you know, working towards more fundamental skills. In other words, it's not only important to understand industry needs, 
but it's really important that we understand our learner needs when we are developing credentials of all sites, but also specifically with respect to micro-credentialing. Now this gets into the modular credential models. Now, <clears throat> what we have with respect to micro-credentialing is we have kind of, again, a diversity of options. We have standalone, we have stackable, we have nested, and we have laddering. And if you notice at the bottom of this little graph that I created, uh, it's not perfect, it's not 100%, it's mixed, but by and large, it seems to be that the non-degree, we do a lot of standalone programming, stackable programming, meaning that if we, if we, if we clearly define what that means, uh, you know, my micro credential A, B, and C can stack together to a macro credential, let's say to a certificate. Nested models are, are ones in which you, you define a, a macro credential, but within there you identify specific modular units that you will actually award a micro credential or a badge. Laddering, <clears throat> that's where it gets really complicated and a little controversial. That's when you take a micro credential and through some form of articulation transfer credit, you move it over to a macro credential, but, 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 here's the but, on the degree end of the house. And that's where it gets a little tricky. Now, if you do notice as well, prior learning assessment and recognition models are embedded, or they should be embedded into all of these aspects, whether they are standalone, stackable, nested, or laddering models, there is the potential to include prior learning and recognition, which is also based on the competency-based framework. Now, what are the challenges? Well, many. In fact, this is a topic onto itself. Right now, the biggest challenge with micro-credentials is that there is no national qualification framework um, that we can utilize. Ontario has one that was established in 2002. Uh, there's a degree qualification framework in 2007. Now the Ontario one is pretty good. They identify certificates level one, level two, level three, and they define the contact hours and what you mean by a certificate. It works well in Ontario, I suppose. It might not work well nationally because we haven't defined our certificates in the same way. There is the European National Qualification Framework that was developed in 2008. New Zealand has one as well. But the qualification frameworks are, are important for this reason. They define currency of credentialing. So in other words, if, if Jessica or if us are gonna develop a micro credential, if we call it a credential, then we have a reference point that we can agree on what that means. And that reference point's important for portability. If we don't have a, a qualifications framework as Alex Usher pointed out in 2001, quite recently in April, then basically you are stripping that element of portability from the learner. There's also no non-degree credentialing framework. And you know, I have to say <clears throat> that's okay. Because I mean, it seems like in, in continuing education, we've been doing a pretty good job not having a formal definition of what a certificate is. So, but that being said, the lack of a non-degree credentialing framework brings into question concerns. Now, when I say questions, it doesn't mean this isn't happening, by the way. It just means it brings into question authenticity of, of, of governance and approval models, authenticity of academic quality assurance, scalability, right? Scalability by that means, can you transfer in, in reference to the 1995 Pan-Canadian Protocol on transferability. Now, again, I say this not to imply that it's not happening, not to imply that there isn't no quality assurance, there is, but it's the optic. It's the optics that's really important. There's also a lack of definitions. I mean, we don't really define well enough at a national level what a short course and program is, what a certificate is. Diplomas are a little different. If they are degree-based, then they are defined by provincial standards, so perhaps that's different. We even don't seem to have agreement fully on credit versus non-credit. So there is a lot of ambiguity, not just with micro-credentialing. Now, I'll just spend a few moments on this and I think I have a, uh, an obligation to mention this. There are some critiques out there. Now, the critiques come more from in the implementation of micro-credentialing on the degree end of the house. So uh, in, in a 2001 paper that was published uh, uh, that actually states within Ontario, the major concern with micro-credentials is that it breaks the nexus between contextually specific applications of theoretical knowledge 
in the rational system of, of meaning in which they were embedded. In other words, there is a concern that micro-credentials and the degree into the house fragment the knowledge base of practice in applied disciplines. <clears throat> uh, the Confederation of, of University Associations of BC released a white paper in March of 2001 echoing those same concerns. The fact that, uh, that learning outcomes of core academic programs uh, will be unbundled from their current comprehensive degree programs in order to generate modular learning programs in profit centers that exclusively serve the vocational interests of business. Uh, it is the gold standard of general you know, education components that gets excised when you slice you know, uh, you know, outcomes into modules. Now, I'm not gonna get into the specific discussions. Again, the concerns are primarily on a degree under the house. No one seems to have a problem with, with a non-degree, but I think it's well worth understanding that there are some concerns and I think, you know, concerns with merit. Now, <clears throat> time to test some assumptions. And this is where I think uh, most of you need to take some um, kind of sit back in your chair and look at this. I've taken some, some um, freedoms and looking at some data and trying to provide some analysis of some assumptions that we made. The first assumption is really looking at the proliferation of interest. Uh, and, and this is an easy one, right? But of course, because so, so here's what I've done. I, I, I created two indices. One of them is called the information index and the other one's called the programming index. The information index is really looking at uh, the summation of all information by way of publications, by way of conferences, webinars, what have you, over a year, summed, up, summed across uh, 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 a period of seven years. For the programming index, I've done the same thing, looking at the number of programs that have been identified as micro-credentials. Most of these have to be done with personal communication, by the way, because I noticed that most of us don't define our programs as micro-credentials on our web pages. So really looking at the programs developed per year, uh, looking again over a period of, of six years. And this, this gives us kind of a, a, a rough index of what's happening by way of, of the proliferation of information. Now, if we look at this, we see that yes, there has been definitely a surge. In fact, the surge has really come post 2019. And, and if we look at that surge, perhaps it's, it's, it's related to a number of factors, but it's correlated also to programming outcomes. We've seen almost an exponential increase in programming activities related to micro-credentialing since I would say post-2018. Now, what's driving this? Well, your guess is probably as good as mine, so here's my guess. The lockdown <clears throat> has really facilitated probably national discourse. COVID-19 has created a lot of unemployment and a lot of, uh, a lot of unease within provinces. And so uh, perhaps a lot of investments in short-term training. Maybe that's what we're seeing. Maybe we're seeing the realities of eCampus Ontario's pilot from 2018, 2019 coming into fruition as well. Hard to say. What we do know is that the rate of program development and micro-credentialing is causing an evolutionary drift in the form and function of these things, these units, that is perhaps outpacing the definition and the development of a national framework, for better or for worse. <clears throat> so let's look at the pseudo -elus you know, like elusive term. And I've already kind of uh, you know, identified that perhaps micro-credentialing is not so elusive and complex as we like to think it is, but let's, let's examine this idea a little bit more. So what I've done is I've, I've done a covariance analysis <clears throat> of, of programming. And um, I've done it across three streams, uh, a four-year undergrad degree in ecology, for example, across the country, 14 programs, 18 programs that are certificates based on uh, business, artificial intelligence, and data analysis, and any micro-credential, I don't care what it was, any micro-credential, 16 programs. <clears throat> now, what I'm about to show you is a covariance analysis, meaning the points that you're gonna see are not related to the 14, 18, and 16, but it's a covariance matrix. So there is way more than 14, 18, 16 points. What you wanna look at is one very specific trend. I put in here a 95 confidence interval uh, envelope. Anything that falls inside that envelope falls within expectation. 
anything that's outside the envelope falls outside of expectation of the covariant structures in reference specifically to number of courses and number of contact hours. So again, if it falls inside the circle, it's predictable. If it falls outside you know, the circle, it's leading to dispersal, the wild, wild west, uh, as it's called. Watch this. It turns out that when we look at the data, no surprise, undergraduate programs in more traditional fields of science are highly predictable because we have a qualifications framework, no surprise there. But, but look at what's happening on, on the right. <clears throat> It turns out that, and unfortunately, I don't have any statistics to, to, to determine levels of significance, but pattern-wise, it seems that the degree of dispersal, it's almost the same for micro-credentialing as it is for certificate programs. In other words, within the university and college sector, this idea that we're just creating things out of the yin-yang and has no, no sense is perhaps not true. Perhaps there is a commonality, and, and in fact, maybe based on this covariance analysis, micro-credentialing and certificate programs are probably not that different from, from one another, which makes a lot of sense because again, we've been doing this for quite some time. So what can we learn from all this? Well, we learned that perhaps micro-credentialing um, are most variable, but the degree of covariance perhaps that, you know, doesn't exceed that of, of certificate programs. Thus, perhaps if anything, if anything, Certificates and micro-credentials are equally elusive, but not one more than the other. And why is that important? No one's having webinars on certificate programs right now. So that's important to know. Now, in terms of micro-credentialing consensus versus confusion, well, taking a look at the literature, and this is some of the stuff that's been published as of late, we do know that there are perhaps 75%, according to HECO in 2021, their report of Canadians who are not familiar with the term micro-credential. So what I've decided to do is to take all the terms that are not part of the definition, but are part of the fundamental elements of the framework. And I've, I put them on there, that's pretty ugly. And don't bother reading it, please don't read it. So what I've done is that I've, I've ranked these according to consensus and confusion. Now, bear in mind, you know, a warning here, this is a very subjective analysis. So I'm sure many of you who are gonna see this may not agree with this 100%, but here it is. Consensus and confusion. So where is most of the confusion that we know of? Well, most of it seems to be on what I've already identified between badges and credentials. When we talk about micro-credentials, what is the credential? Some folks say there is no credential. Some folks say there is the credential. Is it, is it a micro certificate? Is it a certificate? Is it a, a citation? Is it a badge? And if it is a badge, is the badge recognized as a credential within your institution? Not really. And why is it a credential, right? So there's, there's a lot of confusion in this regard. A lot of confusion with respect to degree credit ladder. And I've already mentioned the critiques that are coming out on that and, 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 and the headaches that's causing our, 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 our ROs across the country in terms of how do you do this for concurrent students. Now in the middle is short programs, competency. Uh, those two things are again, important to you know, indicate that there is confusion. Again, we don't know how short is short. We don't really know what competency-based is. Are we really doing competency-based? Maybe, maybe not. Digitally secure transcripts, what does that mean? We all agree it's important, but what does it mean? Embedded. What does an embedded credential mean? Includes Pilar, easier said than done. But do you have a Pilar policy? How is the Pilar policy universally accepted within your institution and, and abroad? But here's the good news, watch this. The rest is what we seem to agree on. So the fact that <clears throat> there has to be digital recognition and articulation of learning, we all agree with that. Validation and recognition, multimodality, you know, we all agree on. You know, Jessica will speak about this shortly, but part of the key of, 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 of a competency-based education format is online learning. Why is that? Because it's the pace of learning is driven by the learner. So there's no accident that micro-credentials are mainly online because they are absorbing that, that you know, that competency-based, you know, you know, component. We all agree it should be discrete. That's the micro part. We all agree it has to be formal, authentic assessments. 
of learning. We all agree that it should be informed by industry and perhaps by learners. There must be, must be, must be a quality assurance element that has to be transferable. It seems like the tides are saying standalone and stackable is where it is. Again, stackable is a bit confusing, but standalone, easy, easy peasy, right? So that's that's kind of uh, you know where we need to be. So <clears throat> here's a, an important observation. We agree on these points. And if you notice those black bars, those are the things that are more or less unique to micro-credentials. Everything else is common to certificates, common to what we've been doing in continuing education for decades, right? And one observation I made is never in our collective history as academic and practitioners of continuing ed, you know, education have we invested so much time and thought on the programming idea as this. So, so, so think about that, right? That's not you know, like necessarily a bad thing. So in other words, we may be reaching consensus despite divergency of action. Now let's talk about the immersion properties here. The sum is greater than the parts. And by that, I mean, <clears throat> what are the transformative aspects of post-secondary education? Are there really transformative things, things that are, are really game changers, right? Is this true? Well, I will argue that <clears throat> perhaps 10 years from now, people will be saying, micro what? Do you remember back in the early you know, 2020s, people were all up in there about micro-credential and maybe five years from now, no one's gonna you know, remember much like MOOCs, right? But here's what I hope. If the micro-credentialing thing fizzles out, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Here's what I hope we do learn. These dialogues have really forced us to think about changing the nature of course and program design. To really maybe perhaps start thinking about 21st century, perhaps advancing our curricular and our pedagogical design, which includes maybe rethinking learning, authentic learning, what does that mean? How does that become an inclusive process, especially from an EDI lens? from an indigenous lens, right? Broadening our definitions of higher education, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, to talk about a learning web, right? Changes of modality within higher education. It's not perhaps just online, it's not just perhaps blended or face-to-face, -face, but maybe we could do a combination, a high flex model, for example, to really adapt and adopt competency-based education. Really think about it. Is that where we want to go? Is that where we want to go? Right? Micro credentials may also help people adapt to change, recognizing the critiques that are out there, and as such, are resilient. These are all good. These are all warm and fuzzy ideas. Here's the one I think is the big impact the, the, the democratization of learning. In other words, the articulation of transferability and portability by way of metadata standards. That's something that we haven't done. And in fact, here's what I argue. This is my humble opinion, Rod's opinion, right? Take it or leave it. I think that the degree is valuable. I don't buy into the notion that degree programs are not training people for the workforce. I think the problem, this is personal opinion, so warning here. The problem is that maybe, just maybe, all those phenomenal skills that our learners are learning at the undergraduate or graduate level perhaps are not being properly translated in terms of what those skills and competencies are. So for the employer, maybe they don't quite understand how to interpret a BA or a Bachelor of Science. What exactly does this person do, right? So a qualifications framework is gonna be ultimately important. Here is the big idea. The fact that we're spending time talking about qualification frameworks, the fact that we're spending time talking about transferability and portability, I think this is the game changer in higher education, in my view. And this is the biggest impact that micro-credentials you know, will have. And this will kind of go on to that learning web that I was talking about, that, that the degree is not dead. The degree is not dead. But that micro-credentialing and, and, and alternative credentialing can augment the lifelong learning experience for learners. Right? Despite the fact that there is, by the way, a surge in people taking short programs over degrees, yes, that's, that's a fact, especially now during the pandemic. I don't think degrees are going anywhere uh, fast. 
But if we look at the long-term picture, I think that fundamental research-based education is here to stay. But certificates and, and, and micro-credentialing and other forms of alternative credentialing certainly augment the realities for lifelong learners. And it's something that we should really think about and articulate and identify. Ideas to practice, programming, you know, development 101. <clears throat> now a couple of, and I have, and these are my last two slides for those of you keeping track of time. Word of warning, <clears throat> based on this whole idea of competencies, there is a knee jerk reaction to say, we have a program in blah, program X, let's convert it to a micro-credential to which many practitioners say, don't do it. I mean, you can do whatever the heck you wanna do, but don't do it if you wanna follow any form of standards, right? You need to ensure that you are developing programs from the bottom up or redesigning programs fundamentally. Traditional courses are not designed to validate discrete learning outcomes. And if we agree that discrete learning outcomes is the basis of a micro-credential, then buyer beware. Be careful from an educator standpoint and from a learner standpoint. So that means that if we're gonna be creating programs and this is kind of a pie in the sky theoretical model, seven stages of program development, right? So the big, the big topics are there has to be a needs assessment, academic and curriculum instructional design components, academic governance, academic quality assurance, portability and transferability. So let's get into all of these. Stage one. In a needs assessment, you need to identify your skills. You need to identify the lifespan of those skills. So micro means micro in many ways, not only micro in content, but perhaps micro in duration, how long that skill and competency will last. Some of them will be perennial. Some of them will be annual. We need to identify that, right? We need to determine funding options for learners as well as strategic revenue goals for us. So as CE units or as, as higher education units, we need to determine where do these fall into our, our, our revenue goals, right? In the curricular design and instructional design, we have to, have to, have to identify discrete learning outcomes, right? And determine assessments that are complementary to competency-based education. Modality plays a role. Work integrated learning, as, as Jessica will talk about shortly, plays a role, right? For academic governance, we need to ensure that we articulate a credentialing framework. We need to ensure that we define what the heck we mean when we say stackable and what we mean when we say laddering, right? We need to determine rules for concurrent students. We need to also ensure that we have quality assurance measures in place by way of review of the content and expert academic oversight of the development. And last but not least, the big idea, digital credential wallets. We need to ensure that this fits within what we want to do. So in summary, what's the big take home? There has been you know, proliferation of ideas with respect to micro-credentials. Perhaps micro-credentials are not as elusive as we like to think they are, right? We may be reaching a consensus. And perhaps there are transformative ideas that we can take home and we can use. And perhaps the most innovative impact of micro-credentialing is a digital art articulation of learning outcomes. And with that, look at that, down to, the, down to the second, I pass it over to my colleague, Jessica, who will talk about the implementations of this in Athabasca. Thank you, Rod. Uh, very uh, thorough, very comprehensive overview of some of the definitions, some of the issues and challenges related to micro-credentials. Now let's take a look at the practical and applied side. What, um, what can Jessica tell us about how micro-credentials play out in practice? Thank you. Sure, thanks David. And thank you Rod so much for such a insightful presentation around micro-credential, you know, the definitions and the theory and the challenges and the interests surrounding the future of micro-credentials. I just wanna make sure everybody can see my screen. David, if you could give me a nod, awesome. Um, so as David introduced me, um, I'm Jessica Scott from Athabasca University. We're Canada's online institution and I lead a unit called Power Ed uh, by Athabasca University. Now, Power Ed is a newer unit. 
at Athabasca University, we this fall will actually be celebrating just our second anniversary of having programming to the public. So we are a startup unit and our focus area is on providing innovative and impactful purpose-built online micro courses and micro credentials that are designed for professionals who are seeking to build competencies for immediate applicability on their own terms. What this means is it's important to us within Power Ed that our micro offerings are structured for self-determined learners. What we're finding through our own research and what we're hearing out on the market is that professionals want more control over their learning and their learning journey. So what we've done is designed our offerings for those self-determined learners. Um, most of our offerings are on demand in nature, meaning the learner can uh, go online, um, source out uh, programming that meets the needs for development that they have, purchase and immediately begin learning. So they don't have to wait for terms or semesters uh, through Power Ed. Currently, we offer six micro-credentials and have another four that are currently in development that we'll be launching at the end of 2021. As an entrepreneurial unit, Power Ed, we also have a business vertical where we partner with organizations to capitalize on Athabasca University's rich history of being a leader in online learning to provide other organizations, post-secondary institutions, nonprofit groups with the capacity and expertise to transform face-to-face -face learning into purpose-built online learning experiences. And we can even host those products on our digital infrastructure as well for our clients. So through our work within Power Ed, we have the opportunity to really listen to professional learners, to hear from leaders overseeing learning and development at small, medium, and large organizations across Canada and globally. And I want to build on Rod's presentation today to share topics that we're hearing on the ground that align to the needs for micro-credentials and micro-learning, and how what we're hearing and seeing on the ground is going to impact the future of micro-credentials from an online learning standpoint, a continuous learning and creating those continuous learning cultures within organizations. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about upskilling and reskilling as well. So with that, as I kick off, I wanted to share with you, um, we recently, I'm giving you a sneak peek into a study that's going to be released uh, from Athabasca University next week that's called Flying the Pandemic Coop. And I'm going to share with you some stats that came out of this study that really validates cultural shifts that we're seeing on the ground with professionals in corporate organizations um, that now's the right time for increased focus, emphasis, and a strategy for micro-credentials in Canada. As Rod said, most uh, continuing education units across Canada have been providing some form of micro-learning, um, perhaps not calling it micro-credentials, uh, for the past many years, for decades. Um, but there's a renewed focus on the term micro-credential and what does that mean in terms of enabling professionals with the competencies, with the skills that they need in order to make career changes or to get back to work. So in May, Athabasca University commissioned this research study with Angus Reid, who conducted a survey focused on Canada's Canadians' attitudes, expectations for work and life in a post-pandemic area, especially as they pertain to um, feelings and thoughts around higher education. This poll was conducted in English and French among nationally uh, representative sample of Canadians who are members of the Angus Reid Forum. And again, this uh, study will be released next week, but I wanted to share a few nuggets from this study and some of the key findings. One of the key themes is employers should really take note, um, as the study found that more than half of Canadians who are unhappy with, with their, they're unhappy with their work, and they say the first thing that they're going to do post-pandemic is look for a new job. About 60% of those surveyed plan to advocate more for themselves at work when it comes to training, learning on the job, and asking for promotions. 
And 70% of those surveyed have a new post-pandemic, no compromise attitude, meaning they want to enjoy work and life. And if something's not working for them, they plan to change things and they have it within their control to change things. The study also found that workplace expectations are uh, changing drastically. Nearly 73% of those responded in this poll want to see their employers invest more in reskilling and offering digital training, especially given the pandemic shift to virtual work. And they also said that they shouldn't have to as employees compromise their continuous learning in their work or in their life. Also, 74% of those surveyed said they have ongoing learning or continuing education goals but only 19% are happy with the status of those goals. So this group is really primed um, to take on learning, to make a move post-pandemic. And over 60% of those uh, surveyed within the study said micro-credentials are something they want to pursue as soon as the dust settles from the pandemic. So, you know, based on this study, micro-credentials are primed to support learning goals of Canadians as we see this I'm not going to settle culture that's brewing across the country. We've all been halted for so long over this past year and a half. Um, we all want to focus on, you know, happiness. And above all else, it's clear that Canadians from this study are willing to do whatever it takes to get there. So now more than ever, micro-credentials are more relevant and meaningful to Canadians. So I'm going to share with you a bit about what we're hearing from Power Ed um, on the ground. And we know that, you know, all of us today, if we can agree on one thing, um, 2020 didn't quite turn out the way that we expected. We know that last year was full of massive change and flux with major riptides continuing to be felt in 2021. And you know, the pandemic has really fundamentally changed the way that we work, the way that we communicate and the way that we learn. Therefore, you know, when it comes to building, online micro-credentials, we really must ensure that they are purpose-built for online learning. We know that not all micro-credentials are going to be online. However, online learning provides some of those advantages in technology uh, that can be implemented to, as Rod talked about, um, assess learning uh, at the beginning, perhaps, of a micro-credential. And the global pandemic has really greatly accelerated the movement of training and development to digital formats. What we did see during the pandemic was that post-secondary institutions, private training organizations were forced to, to move to emergency remote space remote-based delivery through a technology platform like Zoom or Teams that we don't consider to be true purpose-built online learning. And there's an insurmountable difference between uh, purpose-built online micro-credentials, including treating the learner like an online consumer and meeting their expectations versus trying to replicate a, a live um, course through internet mediated technology like Zoom or Teams. So as the dust settles from this last year after the initial panic of shifting to emergency-based remote teaching and learning, we're really seeing the following focus areas. One is, of course, as I mentioned, on purpose-built online learning experiences that we're all taking stock and reviewing those, neuro, those newly converted um, courses with a different eye and with the learner at the center. With micro-credentials in particular, the learning experience can be that much more personalized. Through purpose-built online micro-credentials, competencies can be assessed up front, enabling the learner to fulfill only gaps in knowledge uh, that they need, creating that personalized learning experience that's more just for me, just enough, and just in time. Therefore, in micro-credentials, the learning experience, it doesn't have to be linear. Um, in fact, within Power Ed, we are seeing this where learners want more autonomy and they want to, to self-direct their learning. So they want more control over what they're learning, when they're learning it, and how they're learning it. This brings to the forefront something really important. Rod also mentioned this in his presentation, but the importance on instructional design when we're developing micro-credentials. 
we know that the process of instructional design, it's a field of, of study. Instructional design, it's considered the intellectual technique of the professional who is responsible for the appropriate application of technology to the teaching and learning process. So in other words, instructional design is to the instructional technologist as the rule of law is to the lawyer. And as we go through and develop micro credentials that are competency driven, um, again, we know that learning isn't necessarily going to be linear. You're not going to learn um, a specific framework or tool and then move on in a linear fashion. Your learning may be more um, spotted based on where you have gaps in knowledge. So the importance of instructional design um, really is fundamental to the development of purpose-built micro-credentials. We're all seeing more emphasis on work integrated learning practices um, and organizations and professionals are demanding these uh, immersive experiences. What we've done within Power Ed is um, we've partnered as other institutions have in Canada as well with Amitros Learning out of Ontario um, that is using natural language processing with the, the back end being IBM Watson and creating simulations that can test theories, that can test tools, that can uh, test competencies that are learned within the online classroom through simulated experiences where learners are engaging with artificial intelligence characters. And those characters are providing immediate feedback to the learner on how they're implementing what they learned in the classroom. Um, this is something that's been really successful for Athabasca University as a whole. We even have a 13-week um, virtual co-op through with Amitros Learning where our undergraduate learners, it's their capstone course, are working in a fictitious bank for 13 weeks and applying what they've learned in their Bachelor of Commerce degree program into this fictitious bank and receiving immediate feedback on how they're applying theory to practice. And through these simulations, uh, learners have a safe, you know, and engaging experience uh, to put into practice what they're learning by engaging with these artificial intelligence characters and receiving that that instant feedback. Our learners are loving this and this type of experiential learning and work integrated learning will simply become table stakes, you know, in the future. Also, when it comes to learning, we know that, you know, there's three types of learning. There's accidental, conscious, and deliberate learning. The first kind happens to us. Um, the second kind happens uh, when we learn not necessarily purposefully. And the third kind, deliberate learning, is when we're actively trying to acquire new information. And we need to understand um, learners' needs when they're coming in uh, with a deliberate learning goal when it comes to micro-credentials, when our attention is focused and it's sharp and ultimately we intend to incorporate um, the material deliberately into our existing uh, workplaces. So it's really important to recognize the intention of deliberate learning and we're seeing demand from our learners within our micro-credentials to personalize their learning experience, meaning that each learner's path is different. And the approach to learning, as I mentioned, is really shaking up uh, instructional design practices for micro-credentials. We're also seeing, of course, the shift that Rod talked about in short uh, micro intervals as well. Um, we know people are experiencing even screen fatigue. It's becoming increasingly more important to offer those micro learning opportunities where people can engage with shorter bursts of content, um, put into practice what they're learning and return online to continue their learning journey. We've heard that about 49% of people through a LinkedIn poll said that they just don't have time to learn. So it's on us um, at post-secondary institutions to design learning to fit into professional schedules. And we're hearing from our corporate partners um, more on the emphasis to start to create and develop learning cultures within their organizations. 
where learning really becomes part of every day within the fabric of an organization and embedded in the workplace culture. And I think we're going to see more emphasis on this in the flow and on the job learning, uh, which is suited for micro credential offerings. And this is going to become an area of emphasis um, as we integrate learning into team members and professionals everyday work. And you know, this is further backed up, as I mentioned, on that national poll, the Flying, Flying the Pandemic Coop study, where we said that um, you know, 74% of those Canadian of, of Canadians have identified ongoing learning and continuing education goals, and they want to fulfill them while they're working and while they're on the job. We really think that this is going to signal, you know, the, the nail in the coffin for those um, more scheduled Thursday afternoon sit down learn sessions, the opportunity costs are just too great and the ability for micro credentials to meet the learners where they're at, and to provide programming uh, when it suits the, the learners uh, timeframe is really advantageous for uh, skill development and competency development on the learners own terms. Also, you know, Rod mentioned as well that uh, the learner experience is extremely important. And now that the dust is settling with the pandemic, you know, we're really looking at from an online learning perspective, what was learned um, as, you know, we all had to pivot during this time. In Rod's presentation, he included, you know, that important outline of the seven stages of program development for micro-credentials. And while those stages may vary a bit from institution to institution, the importance is that focus on the learner experience and having the learner at the center of the design, and that should not be compromised when developing micro-credentials. Um, Rod talked about profiles, and within Power Ed, we create personas, which is very similar to what Rod talked about, to really understand what is the motivation behind our learners enrolling in our micro-credentials. And even when we're developing new micro-credentials, creating those primary, secondary, tertiary personas to ensure that the learner's motivation um, is at the forefront of the design and the development of what we're building within Power Ed, whether it's enabling professionals to go back to work or if they're planning on making career changes. Also industry endorsement, Rod talked about industry, industry involvement and endorsement is paramount to ensure that we're designing micro-credentials with the right competencies that are needed. And from a learner perspective, we know that our learners are demanding more now than ever before. And we hear it from our learners that are enrolled in our micro-credentials that they wanna be treated like online consumers. Uh, they wanna experience learning much like they would uh, engage with any other content online. I just want to note too, when it comes to flexibility and stackability and portability, um, this will become table stakes for micro credentials. It will be expected from our learners, even though we're working um, at post secondary institutions to try to figure out you know, the stackability, how micro-credentials can stack into credit programmings. And within Power Ed, about half of our micro-credentials right now actually stack into a credit program. Um, corporate organizations and our learners are going to be demanding that pathway so that their micro-credential isn't seen as something uh, terminal. Um, finally, just to connect on, I want to make sure that we've got time for questions that um, just to sum up, learning and development, you know, it's the order of the day for 2021 and companies are really waking up um, to the realization that rapid upskilling and reskilling is going to be integral to the survival of the organization. And we know this can be done through micro-credentials and micro-credentials, as Rod also mentioned, enable that democratization and access um, in a cost-effective way that can quickly enable Canadians to boost those competencies and those skills to either get back to work or um, to embark on a new career trajectory. So the, the future is bright for 
micro-credentials. So with that, I'm going to pause. My contact information is here. If you've got um, further follow-up that you'd like to connect on post uh, this session, but I'm going to stop sharing here so that we can take some questions, Ron. Thank you, Jessica. That was a really, a, a really timely uh, presentation on, on how micro-credentials are being developed uh, at Athabasca through PowerEd and how we are, are, are actually moving in this direction, <coughs> excuse me, in a more a strategic way. Uh, so many questions have been uh, um, added to the chat function. It's hard to know where to start. So I think I'm gonna start with this last one from Darren Downey. He says, I'd like to hear more about how you assess a competency in asynchronous online courses. Do you need an instructor or is there a way to reliably assess a competency without having to have an instructor evaluate the assessment. I wonder if either of you would like to respond to that. I can take a first stab and then allow okay, right. Jessica. So I think uh, uh, two things. Um, number one is I think you need to define the assessment. If it's a competency-based assessment, you need to uh, define what exactly it is that you are assessing. What are you looking for? Um, and that will define kind of the methodology that you will use in doing the assessment. And so oftentimes competency-based assessments are performance-based. So as I said earlier, the competency is really the application of knowledge and skills. And so if you're truly looking at assessing competency, what you really want to do is, again, focus on the assessment part of it, uh, the development of, of, of authentic assessments uh, that focus on, on what you need to do. Uh, and then you also need to kind of, you know, define, you know, these specific criteria. The other one is, again, is this notion of, you know, does the competency have to be achieved 100%, which it should be, you know, before the learner goes on, and, and that informs kind of the assessment. So, yes, I think, I do think that the instructors need to have uh, a say and need to have input on this process. Uh, Jessica? Uh, and I, I agree with you, Rod. Um, you know, I think that we at our institution, we're trying to reimagine like many uh, institutions are what assessments look like, especially for online learning. And one of the areas, as I mentioned, we're, we're focused on um, engaging with and creating simulated uh, learning experiences where our learners can put into practice um, what they're learning within the classroom into a safe simulated space uh, to showcase that they actually are, we're, we're assessing the competency through simulation and the learner is receiving um, instant feedback. And then that tees them up for a more formal assessment within the classroom. But, you know, this is an area I think that we're all focused on, especially when it comes to alternative assessments and what the future of that looks like, I think is very bright and where we're going with alternative assessments. Thanks, Rod. Thanks, Jessica. We have a number of other questions. Uh, I'm going to go to one that was asked a little bit earlier on, um, and this has to do with the sort of the laddering of micro-credentials into potential de degree programs. And the comment was made by Julia uh, Denholm that faculty perceptions of micro-credentials uh, infilt infiltrating the degree end of the house are often very negative. And, and she said, even at some, at some points, uh, people, uh, faculty perceive micro-credentials to be e evil in a sense. So um, I guess my question, I thought that was a provocative comment um, and I can see how people might uh, perceive uh, that, but how do we, um, how do we present micro-credentials as, as being complementary learning activities, complementary to degree programs as opposed to um, com competing against them in a sense? I, I can say this. Um, and I mean, this is something, especially with uh, Power Ed being newer to Athabasca University that um, we have definitely encountered. And I don't think as you mentioned and the question came forward that it's unique to us um, that we are competing against um, some of our faculties in terms of some of the content that we've created and, and developed. I don't know that people have seen us necessarily as evil, um, but what is starting to happen is there is more of, at our institution anyway, openness to exploring and looking at um, 
what, you know, how do competencies align across non-credit to credit? So we're focusing it more on the competency structure. As I said, right now, only 50% of our offerings actually ladder into a degree program at AU at the graduate level and undergraduate level. We've got a long way to go, but we're, we're starting. And part of it is, um, thinking differently about how we serve the learner, because at the end of the day, it's about the learner. And once some of our faculty members are seeing enrollments coming through and are seeing learners move from power ed into the credit side of Athabasca University, they're getting more on side and recognizing the impact that we can have together. Great, thanks, Jessica. Rod, any comments on, on that question? Yeah, uh, I agree. I think the other aspect that we need to do is uh, to emphasize needs to be complementary. Uh, on the degree end of the house, I am a firm believer, again, personal opinion, that um, nothing will replace a degree program. And I think that if micro-credentials on a degree end of the house are going to be implemented, they need to be complements to lifelong learning. And I think that by doing so, we need to ensure that proper academic oversight is in place mm -hmm. and that we also need to ensure that governance structures have to align with the rigor of the degree programs. In other words, the perception that many faculties have is that this can't be a backdoor uh, into, into programs, nor undermining the value of professional qualifications like social work, for example. So in the province of Manitoba, there have been some concerns about the use of micro-credentialing in fields like social work, which could, it, perhaps enable folks to get certain forms of recognition that perhaps they shouldn't be getting. So I think conversations need to be had, but at, as long as there's an effort to lead those conversations internally, and here's, here's the key, that institutions be part of those conversations and, these, and that these conversations not be predefined by external agencies, i.e. government. I think that's where the sensitivity comes in. Uh, one, one last thing I was going to mention, and it's not in, re in reply to a comment, but I know that we're almost up for time, and I do want to say this. Uh, I'd like to uh, put a shout out to our marketing team. I think that um, uh, the success of this webinar and the ones that have come prior are, are really a reflection to the great work that our marketing team have done, uh, led by uh, you know, Randy Pollack, who is our director of marketing. So I'd like to thank uh, you know, our marketing team and Extend Education for putting this together for us in terms of uh, putting the word out. And again, the participants that are here are largely thanks to those efforts. So thanks to marketing. Thanks, Rod. I, I, so I have one last question. It's based on a sort of an amalgam of a number of different questions. So who's in the driver's seat as we try to tie up this webinar today? Who's in the driver's side is, seat as we look forward? Is it the, uh, the, the individual learner who, as Jessica mentioned, wants, is, continue, is in increasingly wanting to be autonomous, want to be self-actualizing, want to be able to learning on time on an as-needed basis? Is it industry? Is it their employer that really is in the driver's seat? Is it government? Um, how, how, how should we perceive this uh, changing landscape uh, uh, in, in the area of micro-credentials? Who's in the driver's seat anyways? Jessica, do you want to start? Actually, you go ahead first on this, <laughs> Rod. <laughs> well, let me see if I understand correctly. So who's in the driver's seat in terms of, in terms of what, David, because you cut out for a second. Well, who's really in control here? Is it really a government that's, uh, in, at least in some provinces, making post-secondary institution funding dependent on the development of micro-credentials? Is it industry is or in specific employers dictating to individual learners what they need to learn. Um, okay. Maybe it's all of them. Yeah, I think honestly, again, this is my opinion. I think that, you know, government plays an important role as this industry, but I think any kind of credentialing effort needs to be led by the institution. First and foremost, they can be informed by efforts, they can be uh, informed by practices, but they need to be led by the institution. And there is where the concern lies when these efforts are done externally. When, when, when governments will define for you what the program length is that they will fund, when programs, when, when government defines certain criteria. So I think this is why it's important that we have these conversations and, and that we reach consensus and that we can, we can work with, with stakeholders and, and help define the space in a much better way. Great. Thoughts I would just add, yeah, I would add really quickly that I know we're over time that industry obviously also plays a really important role um, in endorsing 
you know, what, what we are doing, because at the end of the day, this is about, you know, jobs and ensuring that our learners have the right competencies and skills to be successful in the workplace. So an endorsement by industry is, is paramount as well. Great. Well, thank you very much to both of you. Uh, a, a huge uh, thank you for um, increasing our knowledge base, getting us thinking about some of the harder questions, some of the challenges that lie ahead. Uh, looking at both the theoretical and the practical, I think was a really uh, good idea. And I, so I, I thank both of you for uh, thinking of that approach. And I thank everyone that joined us today. And uh, out of respect of the time that we said we would run, uh, I see that our time is up. We should probably wrap things up, but please don't forget about the uh, final webinar in this series. And that is on a week from today, Friday, June 18th. Uh, called The Recognition of Alternative Digital Credentials with Julia Denholm, who is on the call today, and Dan Piedra uh, from McMaster. We look forward to hearing what they have to say as we continue this really interesting and uh, very challenging conversation. Have a great day, everyone. And uh, once again, thanks for joining us today. <laughs>